Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday, and welcome to Bates Botanical Boot Camp. Today, we are discussing intro to houseplants. So if you are brand new to houseplants, or if you have never gotten into houseplants before, and you're looking to start your journey, this is the place for you. Um, We're not going to go too in-depth on stuff. Just keep it a little bit more surface level, um, just for those of you who have no idea what you're in for, which is a world of beauty and new companionship, higher levels of oxygen in your home, just so many great things come along with um, choosing a new house plan and bringing it home. So we're going to start talking about what you need to think about with your house plants. Now, yes, they're called house plants, but all of these come from somewhere where they can survive outside, where they've been um, harvested from nature, if you will. We have a lot of hybridized plants. Um, that have been made. I mean, there's so many cool things about plants. Again, I'm going to try not to nerd out and go too in depth. So again, if you think about plants, I mean, most of them, all of them come from being outside. So you're trying to create more of an outside climate within your own home, whether it's a rainforest climate or a desert scape. All these plants come from different regions, different places, and their needs are going to be different. So if you walk into a place to select your new house plant. You're not going to just get a cactus and maybe a fern and say, here we go. I'm going to put these in the same spot and they're going to do great. I'm going to water them at the same time. Absolutely not. Their needs are going to be entirely different because they have come from a different spot. So we're going to start by talking about lighting, which sometimes can be the hardest thing for people just getting into houseplants. And it can even still be difficult for those of us who have been growing houseplants our entire lives. You might get a new plant and you're not sure. So a lot of times if you're looking up info online or if you're in a garden center, maybe their tags say low light, high light, medium light, and you might not know what that means. So we're going to go through that. So we're going to start with low light. Now, low light does not mean no light. All plants need some sort of natural light or you can get grow lights. Um, We'll talk about that a little bit later, but there is going to need to be some sort of light. So low light means a window in the room, some kind of natural light coming in. I do have a lot of customers here at Bates Nursery and Garden Center where we are filming from today. And by the way, my name is Caroline, did not introduce myself, that want to get a plant for, say, their basement. And they say, well, it doesn't have any lighting, but I want a plant that's alive. It's going to eventually die, even if it just sits there. So low light means maybe a north-facing window. It doesn't get any direct light, but there is light bouncing off of trees and coming in from outside or an interior wall of your house. It could be here is your window. It could be west-facing. It could be east. And then you've got a wall right here. This spot would be more of a low light situation. And I do have a lot of low light plants on this table. So low light, north facing window, interior wall. These are also going to a lot of times require a little bit less water or more water monitoring because they're not going to dry out as quickly since they don't have as much sunlight. So some of my favorite low light house plants that I have in here with me today are going to be Sansevieria, Dracaena, which are these back here. And these are also fantastic beginner house plants for you. If you are, like I said, trying to get into house plants, you're not sure where to start. These are great beginner plants. They require low water and they're very versatile when it comes to lighting. They can handle some of the lowest light in the house plant world, or at least the common house plant world. Um, They're pretty cool. A lot of people think snake plant, which is also another name for these. Mother-in-law tongue is just boring. You see them in dentist's office, doctor's office. They remind you of being in trouble in the principal's office in school wrong. And there's so many cool, exciting kinds like say this one. Wow. Whale fin Sansevieria, which you might not have seen before. So great lower light house plants. Um, also, ooh, Tyler zooming in. Speaking of Tyler, good morning, Tyler. Good morning, Caroline. Yay. Happy to be here. So Spathophyllum, Peace Lily. I'm going to show this one off right here. Another lower light house plant that we sell here at the nursery. This one is Domino. So it's a variegated type of peace lily. If you see the white on the leaves. Ooh, she's so pretty. So those are some good, easy, easy care, great beginner, low light house plants. And like I said, they're versatile. A lot of times when labels will say these are good for low light, they'll thrive more in medium light. By thrive, I mean they're going to grow quicker. 
Um, they're going to be a little bit happier, but they can tolerate lower light, lower than most other plants. So some lower light plants that I do have on this table that I'm going to say are not as easy. Ooh, so I've got a silver dollar fern. It's a type of maidenhair fern, and it is so cool. So she's going to like lower light. She's going to thrive in a north-facing window, but she's going to be so sassy. So for those of you who are maybe tuning into this webinar today, you know a little bit more about houseplants, and you want a challenge for that low light spot, this will be the gal for you. And then also spider plant. Chlorophytum right over here and this beautiful I'm just gonna bring this over. We just got these in this morning. <gasps> wow. Look at it. So a lot of people see these and they think, ooh, that it's gonna like a little bit higher light. Wrong. They're actually lower light and they are an easy beginner friendly house plant. Um, I kind of forgot that I had that on this table. So great beginner plants that are happy in low light are going to be Sansevieria, Dracaena, Spathophyllum, and spider plant. There are a lot of other ones. You can always message us. You can come into the nursery. One of my favorites ag is Aglionema, which is Chinese evergreen. They are gorgeous. They thrive in a north facing window. So now let's talk about medium light. So medium light is going to be somewhere in between low and high light, obviously. So they're going to like morning sunlight. A lot of my medium light house plants I have in an east facing window. So they get some very, very soft, very early morning sunlight. And then the room is going to stay pretty brightly lit until late afternoon. Now, it doesn't have to be in that morning east facing window. It can go into a south or west room, but with those, I do not put them directly in front of the window. I'll have them on an opposite facing wall. So we talked about the interior wall with the north facing low light plants. Now this is going to be opposite. Yes, it's still interior, but it's going to be across from the window. So say my window was here, that plant is going to go over here. So it's not going to be right in front of the window where it might be fried coming through those window panes if you don't have curtains, but it'll be across so it gets some nice filtered or diffused light throughout the day. Now, some great options for medium light house plants that I do have on this table. Pothos, which actually can also tolerate lower light. So, but I have mine in medium light. They tend to grow better um, for me in medium light. I have mine in an east facing window like we discussed. So it gets that morning light. And we have two types of pothos in here. We've got the global green right here and then the Baltic blue right here. And pothos is kind of a common name. Um, Skindapsis is also people classify or put that into the pothos category. Um, so there's a lot of different types under the pothos name, which I would say isn't always correct. Um, but when I say pothos right now, I'm generally talking about leafy trailing plants that love low to medium light. Now with that medium light, what's going to happen without it getting highlight, which we will discuss momentarily, is these trailing plants are gonna trail even more because they're gonna be reaching for more light that they can find. We'll talk about plant care a little bit later, but these are, again, some of my favorite beginner-friendly plants. So if you're not looking for an upright plant like the Sansevieria, Dracaena, and Spathophyllum, the trailing pothos will be a great option for you. As you can put it on a shelf, you can hang it, um, from a hook in your ceiling, and you can also give them haircuts from time to time, which is really, really fun. So we've discussed low light and medium light. Now let's talk about high light. So when I say high light, we're talking about south and west facing windows or rooms, and we're talking about six hours of sunlight a day. It doesn't have to be direct sunlight. It can be bright, um, indirect that comes through maybe a light white colored curtain, um, but it needs to get six hours of bright sunlight throughout the day, each day. And unfortunately, I don't, I guess I missed bringing my cactus in, which is sad because I love cactus so much. But when we talk about highlight, my favorite highlight plants are, of course, going to be cacti. Those can tolerate the most light. So if you live in a glass house and you have all this lighting, cactus is going to do the best. They're going to thrive in full sun. They actually need that to survive. Um, I find that a lot of ficus, not all of them, but quite a few, about half of ficus, tend to like medium to highlight. So they're going to be really happy in front of or 
kind of near a west facing window. So we've gone through low light, north facing window, interior side walls, medium light. It's a brightly lit room, morning sunlight and a wall across from that window. And then highlight is going to be north west windows, either in front of the window or close to it that gets about six hours of bright sunlight a day. And again, it doesn't have to be direct. It doesn't have to be hit with that sun. There's a lot of plants whose leaves will burn if it gets too much sun right away. So we've gone through lighting for plants and I am going to mention if you have any questions at all throughout this webinar, you can type them in the chat box on Zoom or in the comment box on Facebook. We will also open up at the end for a nice Q&A. But if you have any questions at all as I talk, uh, Tyler over here, which we have a Tyler cam, but I don't know if it's active today. Not today. Oh, sad. So we won't get to see Tyler's face. So I have a lot of people that come into the nursery. Now we're talking about picking out your new plant. We've talked about lighting. So you'll want to look at your space, kind of decide where you want to put that plant. You can even bring in photos. Those always help us here at our nursery and other nurseries where you will go to so you can actually show lighting. Sometimes it's hard to really tell what kind of lighting you have. Um, but all plants will grow. So if they are getting the right amount of light, the right amount of water, and if you're fertilizing correctly, these plants are going to grow, which is what you want. Now, I do have quite a few customers that come in to get, say, a large fiddle leaf fig and they want it to fit a space, and they want it to fit that space immediately, and then they say, so it's going to stay this size forever? Absolutely not. If you're doing good with your plant, if you're doing well, if that plant is happy, if it's thriving, it is going to grow. So you want to start a little bit smaller, knowing that that plant's going to get larger. Now, some plants grow quicker than others. Some are slow growing. So you'll want to do your research, and again, ask questions. That's what us garden center people are here for to answer all those questions for your first time getting a plant. Another thing to consider is, is this plant pet safe or child safe? There are quite a few plants out there that are extremely toxic to pets and children and adults. I mean, anyone who's going to consume that plant. We don't want that. Um, but there are some pet safe, children safe plants. A lot of ferns are pet safe. Calathea, pet safe. A um, lot of palms. One big one to stay away from when it comes to toxic levels is sago palm. So I know that sounds confusing as I just said a lot of palms are safe, but sago palm is not. It's one of the more poisonous houseplants that are readily available in the houseplant market. Sago palm and also desert rose, which is a gorgeous flowering um, kind of desert looking tree. Very poisonous and toxic. Um, so and when you introduce a new house plant into your home, you'll want to do some research just to make sure it is going to be safe or maybe you don't need to put it up into a different spot in that room or where you you were looking to put it. So moving on, Tyler, do we have any questions yet? No, if we do, I'll let you know and I'll interject. But I like asking, so it gives me a chance to drink some coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going to talk about watering. And I would say this is the biggest downfall with houseplants, um, with people killing houseplants, with them having problems with leaf drop, leaf spotting, watering. It's hard to figure out watering. There's a lot that goes into it. There's way more than people consider. And I would say watering schedules are not a good idea. Now, that's my opinion. Some people love their watering schedules. I do not. I find when I try to have a watering schedule, there's too many variables in seasonal changes, just the temperature in my house, my husband leaving my door open for a long time, and that's going to change how it is inside, that I do not stick to a watering schedule. Now, with that being said, I mean, every Monday when I'm not working as much, I'll go ahead and check my houseplants to see if they do, in fact, need water. But... To each his own. If you would like to have a watering schedule, by all means, have a watering schedule. But know that not all of your plants are going to be watered on a Tuesday. So if you have a cactus and you have a pothos and you have a fern, those will definitely not be all watered at the same time. So you'll want to do your research with those new plants, cacti and succulent, Sansevieria dracaena. They like to stay very, very dry. They can sit dry for months. I have had all of those plants and all of those plants, at least one variety of them, I have forgotten about. And probably, I think I forgot about a Sansevieria for a solid three months once, and it was completely fine. And I've had customers come in looking at plants, telling me stories about, oh, I had this plant, this mother-in-law tongue, and I went on vacation 
for four months. And when I came back, it was fine and nobody was watering it. So those clearly are not going to need to be watered once a week. And then plants such as ferns, some times with some of my ferns, I'm watering them every other day. So you'll want to check them. A good way to check plants is if they're in a smaller pot, you can pick that pot up. And as your relationship grows with that plant, you'll know more and more whether it needs water or not based off of weight, which is what we're talking about with this method. So you can just pick up that plant. If it's light, clearly it needs water. If it feels heavy, heavier than usual, it's retaining moisture and it doesn't probably doesn't need to be watered at that time. You can also use the finger test where you stick your finger in the top half inch to two inches of soil, depending on the plant size and pot size, to see if it's dry and if it's time to water. Now, like I said, all plants require a different watering schedule. So some are going to want to stay completely dry while others need to stay moist or they'll die. I smiled for a reason. I have probably, I would say for me, the hardest house plant to grow. I'm going to pull this one out. So this is a good example. So this Hartley fern, people come into the nursery all the time when we have them and they're like, Ooh, look at that fern. She's gorgeous. And I want to bring her home. I have killed about at least two, maybe three. I currently do not have one. These love a lot of humidity. And as soon as they dry out, they don't die, but those leaves are going to immediately shrivel up. They can be brought back to life, but it's pretty hard. And overwintering these is kind of a nightmare. So if you're looking for a challenge, a Hartley fern might be the plant for you. But again, another good example of if you let that soil dry out, especially for too long, this plant's going to be gone within a matter of days. If it does stay dry for, I think about three days will kill it. One to two, you can resurrect it. But the resurrection time of this plant is like a month, month and a half. It's kind of cool. Those leaves will eventually flush back out slightly, but they'll have damage forever. So how do I water? Huh? Let's talk about that. So a lot of people, when they go to water, they think, when plants get watered in nature, that rain just falls down on the leaves and just into the plant and then into the soil. Wrong. And again, this is my opinion, but if your plant is inside and it's not getting a lot of direct sun, it's not drying out because a lot of times it will rain in nature, then the sun will come out, whether it's that day or the next day, and it will dry off the plant fairly quickly. Now, if you water it in your home, your humi humidity level in your home is usually about like 40 to 50 percent. Those leaves are not going to dry out completely, and it's going to lead to fungal problems, bacterial problems. It's going to attract pests. Your leaves are going to start dropping, and eventually your plant will die. So when you go to water these plants, specifically plants that like to be on the drier side, and philodendron, ficus as well, water at the base of your plant. So if it's a smaller plant, sometimes I'll bring them into my sink thoroughly water it. And when I say thoroughly, I let the water come out of the bottom of the pot. But that's going to do is get to all of those new roots that are towards the bottom of the pot. If you don't water it enough, it causes a lot of problems. One of the biggest problems I believe that it causes is shallow root growth. So if you're not letting it run out, it's not getting moisture to those new roots towards the bottom of the pot. It also helps flush salts out of the soil. So we, you just let it run through, let it dry out completely, put it back in its spot, and it's ready to go. Um, a lot of people, I keep saying a lot of people, but it's just a common mistake that happens. Watering, like I said, is confusing. Here in the greenhouse, I train people to water our house plants, and it can be tricky sometimes. It's, there's a whole science behind it. But when you're watering your plant, like I have people that will have a huge fiddle leaf fig in like a 14-inch pot. So when I say 14-inch pot, I'm talking about the diameter across, which it's like this big. I don't know. It's like a, it's like a pizza. And I'll ask them, how often are you watering it when they come in with a problem? That's usually my first question. And they'll say, oh, like half a cup a day. Not good enough. Uh, what that half a cup is doing is just going onto the very, very top layer of soil. It's not getting to the root system. It's not going all the way down. And it's going to evaporate really quickly. So you might as well not be watering your plant. Or if you're giving it two cups in a pot that 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 is that size, it's still not enough. You need to soak that plant. Um, so think about in nature when it rains a whole lot, 
more than, you know, like a 20 minute little shower in the summer. When you get like a whole day of rain, think about how happy all those plants outside, all those annuals, all those flowering perennials, how happy they're going to look for the next few days from getting all that water, retaining it in their soil for a little bit so they have time to really drink it up. And when they're drinking that water, they're also consuming other nutrients that are in the soil. Whether you fertilized it, whether you use compost, it's all related and it's all mixing in. So avoid watering your leaves. Uh, Segwaying kind of into that statement, Mm -hmm. what do you think about self-watering pots for those that like to stay more moist? Mm. Okay, self-watering pots. I have... um, I've tried quite a few of self-watering pots. I do think they'd be great. Now, there's self-watering pots that have basically a tray in the bottom, and then the pot sits on top, and it's like a chamber in the bottom that will hold water. Um, There's a lot of different kinds. There's some more expensive ones that kind of have a science behind them that I would say are a lot better. And there's also some that have a wick in them. I'd say the wick is better. When I say a wick, it's basically like a shoestring or like a candle wick is what it looks like. And it's going to wick water into the soil. And it's, it is really good for ferns, like especially this maidenhair fern, this wonderfully terrible heartleaf fern it would be great for. Um, African violets usually really love it because they don't like to get their leaves wet when they get watered. It'll cause damage to the leaves. But I would say those self-watering pots, I got some at Target uh, at the beginning of the season. And all it really does, if your plant is not fully established and has roots going all the way to the bottom, it just kind of sits there. Um, So if your plant, like I said, if it's pretty tight with its root system and you can stick it in that pot and those roots can get to that moisture, it's going to work really well. But if it's a new plant and your roots are just sitting on top with an inch or more of soil in the bottom, it's probably not going to do much. Um, But give it a try. Like I said, it works for some of my plants while others it doesn't. Um, But ferns are really going to benefit from it if you have the right kind of self-watering plot self-watering pot. Um, Calathea would also do okay. They can get a little finicky, especially in the winter, if they stay wet for too long. Um, But wicking is also another good option. I have not personally used it, but I know a lot of people here at the nursery that have, even with outdoor plants. Um, One of our office ladies, Julie, who was amazing, said that one year she did that with some shrubs she hadn't planted in the ground. She literally took like a shoestring, cut the ends off that are hard and had um, a couple gallon sized jugs with water and put that shoelace into the water and then into the plant. So it was just slowly absorbing water as the soil would dry out. It would water the plant. So she was gone. I can't remember how long she was gone, but she said when she got back, all of her plants looked amazing. But like I said, there's so many methods out there um, when it comes to watering. But the biggest thing you want to watch is make sure you're watering correctly, obviously. Um, And when it comes to most plants, it's just thoroughly watering that plant. And then depending on its dry needs, letting it dry out completely or slightly before you water it again. There are some plants that don't really bounce back from being overwatered. And I tell people all the time, it's so much easier to come back from underwatering as opposed to overwatering. Overwatering causes root rot, which is just really sad. Um, Like I discussed before, fungal problems on the leaves, bacterial problems. It'll also attract fungus gnats. Um, So that is a common pest, which we're going to talk about pests in a little bit. Fungus gnats are a common pest when it comes to houseplants. And that is primarily a sign of overwatering. So if you have little bitty, like black, dark colored bugs flying around your plant, especially when you go to water it or move it, and it's like a cloud of bugs that come up, fungus gnats. And you are keeping your plant too moist. Now... Some plants have to stay pretty moist, so it does tend to happen. There's a lot of methods you can use to get rid of fungus gnats. Uh, One is changing out your soil. Um, Sometimes, especially the big box stores, you'll get some soil, and it will come with fungus gnats. That's been a problem this season with some, some bags of soil come with those fungus gnats. So if you have a fungus gnat problem, go ahead and change out your soil, get a new bag, maybe a different brand just to make sure it wasn't in that bag. You can flush it out with hydrogen peroxide if you're not ready to change out the soil, which I usually use a one to four ratio, four parts water, one part hydrogen peroxide. You can also get sticky traps that's going to 
trap those little bugs to their death. But again, if you have fungus gnats, it's probably a sign that you have been watering too much. So we've talked about watering. Um, we're going to jump over to kind of a, a, a slight topic relating to watering and just talk about humidity and misting. So a lot of people miss their houseplants. And a lot of people will miss all of their houseplants. I do not miss my houseplants. Uh, the only ones that I do miss are my ferns because they like to stay moist. And a lot of them, not all, but some of them, especially the ones I have, are epiphytes, meaning they grow on trees in the wild. Um, they're not planted in ground, but they attach themselves to a tree or even like lightly on the forest floor. Um, and they like to get that moisture. A lot of them, those epiphytes absorb their moisture through the air instead of being in like dense soil and getting their moisture there. So I will miss those like staghorn ferns. I will miss that. Um, in the winter, I will slightly miss my calatheas from a distance. I'll stand back, you know, make it a moment, make it a thing that happens, miss that calathea. But ficus, do not miss that. Just don't do it. You're Ficus is going to get spots all over those leaves. Um, Sansevieria, they don't like to be misted. They're going to get big old bacterial spots, which will get like this big and get pretty gross. So steer clear of misting. Um, there's a lot of info out there online, um, a lot of different opinions. So some people say miss, some people don't. Uh, just do your research. But also when I say do your research, I don't mean Google. I mean literally hands-on research with your new plants. It's going to be different for everybody. Everybody's climate, everyone's um, environment and their home is different. You know, some people keep their house at 78 right now, while others keep their house at 62, which is wild. Um, so if you have the same house plant, that's going to adapt to that differently than your friend's house that stays very cold. So just consider that. Um, and then also something to talk about with moisture, with humidity that is in the soil. When you go to repot, which is our, our next thing that we're going to transition into shortly, you think about when you pull your plant out of the nursery pot, for the most part, you can see the roots. And sometimes the roots grow all the way around that soil. You may barely be able to see the soil, um, but it'll hold, <clears throat> excuse me, hold the shape of that pot when you pull the plant out. That's root bound or it's on its way to being root bound. So that root bound plant is going to be needing to be watered more often because it's going to be absorbing that water so quickly because it doesn't have a lot of ex excess soil around because those roots have grown into the soil. There's a, they've absorbed nutrients from that soil. There's a, they have absorbed moisture from the soil and you're going to be watering it more often. So when you go to repot, what do you do when you repot? You add more soil and you put it into a slightly larger pot. So when you do that, it's going to have excess soil for those roots to grow. And with that excess soil, it's going to hold more moisture. So you'll have to adapt your watering schedule. You're not going to be watering it nearly as much. Because if you do, that water is just going to sit around the roots while they get established into their new home. And they're going to start to rot. So while I've I've mentioned root rot twice now, before we transition to repotting and soils and types of pots. Let's talk about root rot. So it is, I would say, one of the most common problems that's not pest related um, with houseplants. And it comes from overwatering or plants sitting too long and um, too moist of soil. And some signs of root rot will be leaf dropping, leaf spot. If it's a Sansevieria, which is this plant right here, a lot of times towards the base of the plant, it will become droopy and kind of mushy. It's not coming back from that. Absolutely not. So you'll want to remove all of those gross, black, yellowing, brown. Um, you can put your finger in it sometimes. You'll want to cut all that off. And I always suggest, it, even if you suspect it's root rot and you're not sure, pull your plant out of the pot and look at the roots. For the most part, roots are going to be white, tan, orange, or red. The orange and red Roots are so cool. Uh, Dracaena and Sansevieria usually have orange roots. And that's a sign of a healthy root. Now, a lot of ferns have black or dark colored roots. So it's harder to tell with ferns, but usually there's a smell that comes along with rotting in ferns. So we're going to disregard ferns. We're talking about this type of root rot right now. But for the most part, all other plants are going to have healthy looking white or orange colored roots. Now, if you pull it out and those roots look black, if it looks m kind of mushy and gross, 
you have root rot on your hands. And what I would suggest doing is knocking off all the soil that's on that plant, removing it, cutting off anything that's rotten. And I usually will cut, I mean, if it's a smaller plant, you probably don't want to go as high because you do want to leave some roots, but you'll want to go up like half an inch at least to cut it off to make sure that you get all of that stuff that's rotting in the roots removed. One thing I like to use is cinnamon. I'll sprinkle that on my, um, on my roots. It helps. It's like an antifungal. It'll help stop that, stop that rotting from happening. Um, there's a lot of amazing things about cinnamon. We're not going to go into that right now. Um, and then repot it. So let it dry out, put it in some fresh soil, and maybe, I don't know, adjust your watering schedule. Watering schedules also need to be adjusted seasonally. And we'll talk about seasons after we talk about soil and repotting. We're going to start by talking about types of pots. So there's a lot of pots out there. And I commonly get the question, I bought this really cool pot, but it does not have a drain hole. Can I plant this plant in it directly? No. I mean, you can. You can do whatever you want. But that moisture can't escape. It's all going to be trapped in. Water is going to sit in the bottom if you're not watering a precise amount, depending on that plant's needs, seasonally, daily, what type of plant it is. You'll really have to learn your plant and how much water it needs. So when I say a pot with no drain hole, we usually call them cachets, which I have one right here with this. Oh my God. Someone's going to have to buy this fern after this webinar. And that someone is me. We just got them. Yeah. Huh? We just got them. We got them in this morning and I snagged them. So as you notice, no drain hole. So I am a fan of these pots. And what I do with these pots is take my nursery pot, drop it inside. And I feel like it's good for a number of things. It's easier to water. It works as a saucer, but doesn't give the look of, you know, a plastic saucer, which I'm not a huge fan of. And I know a lot of people out there are not. It'll hold that, um, hold that plant. And then when I go to repot it, I'll just pot it up into a nursery pot and move it into another cache. So I suggest steering clear of directly planting in a cache or just a pot with no holes. Now there's some, if you really, really wanted to do it, there are some plants that are going to do a little bit better in that. Um, pitcher plants, Venus flytrap, those boggy plants do like to stay wet. So your chances of killing them by drowning them are way less. Ferns will do a little bit better, um, but you don't want to drown them. Do not plant a cactus, Sansevieria, Dracaena in one of these. Aglionema would probably die right away. There's a lot of plants that will rot really quickly. So steer clear of that. Now, I've got another pot here. This is my favorite pot that we have here at Bates Nursery and Garden Center. Um, and when I put this beautiful pink Fetonia nerve plant in it this morning, I came in and I gasped and I made Tyler look at it straight away. So I'm also going to be buying mm -hmm. this after work today. So I'm going to take this out. I did just drop this in, but we have a drain hole. That is exactly what you want. This one comes with the saucer. Saucers are always good. They're going to save your furniture. Um, you don't have to have a saucer. Some people think they do have to have a saucer. You don't. You're just going to leave a water ring if you don't let it dry out in a sink or outside before you bring it in. So I would say this is an ideal pot. Also, this is a terracotta with not like a full glaze on it. It's got some kind of, I don't know much about pottery itself and all of the things that go behind it, all the techniques. But terracotta is one of my favorite, especially with um, drier plants, with cacti, succulents, sansevieria, and even some leafy plants, philodendron. Um, they tend to wick moisture out of the soil, especially if you have an unglazed terracotta. So if you do overwater, if you suspect you overwatered, if you're worried about watering, um, terracotta might be the pot for you. It does help kind of control moisture in that soil it will wick it out. Now, if you have a plant that's more on the moist side, it likes to stay wet, heart leaf fern. Uh, you might want to go with a ceramic pot or even a plastic pot, which those are just fine to use. Ceramic can be a little bit heavier, especially if you move into larger size plants like tree form, ficus, cinnamon trees, big old philodendrons. Um, you might want to just leave it in that spot. And then I have one more that we're going to talk about and I see this a lot here with our pottery and um, 
you know, around town when I'm pot shopping because I go pot shopping constantly. So a lot of them have plugs in the bottom. You see that? So cool. It looks so cool presenting this. Um, sometimes they're in from the bottom up. Sometimes they're in from the top down. So you'll want to remove that plug when you water. But also make sure when you go to repot it that that plug is not put in from the top in. Because it's going to be impossible to get out um, without repotting your plant. So make sure that plug, sometimes they're hard to see, is removed or removable before you directly put your plant in there. And with these, especially with my hanging pots, and this is a hanging pot, it comes with some beautiful, lovely macrame. Um, I will water it, let it drain, and then put this back in so it doesn't spill, you know, a little bit of water all over my very, very fancy house. Just kidding. It's full of plants and dogs. All right. So we've talked about pots. Now, what do you put in your pots other than your plant, Tyler? Um, other than your plant? Mm -hmm. Soil. Yes, you yeah. put soil <laughs> in your pot. So there can be some confusion on soil. And I, I've always been into plants. I've always been into house plants. But it took a long time before I was like, oh, there is a large difference between indoor soil, outdoor soil, potting, container soil, in-ground soil. Um, it's a whole world out there. So with house plants, you'll want to look for an indoor soil. It's going to be lighter. It's going to have good drainage to keep from getting root rot. And it's just going to have the right things in it for, um, for your house plants. So I brought a sample of what we, one of the types of soil we have here at Bates Nursery. It's the Earth Mix Proganics Indoor, and I absolutely love it. So let's see if we can get, oh, wow, look at that soil. That so we've got some perlite in there. Beautiful, beautiful soil. Give Earth Mix a follow. Give them a shout. I mean, I didn't start using Earth Mix until I started working here about three years ago, and my plants are just so so much happier. Um, I use it for my house plants. I use our in-ground garden for outdoor. It's great. So it's formulated specifically for house plants. And with this indoor soil, I don't add anything if I'm planting leafy plants. So if I'm doing um, pothos, spathophyllum, um, some philodendron, I will leave it at just this straight soil. I don't think it needs to have anything added to it for drainage. My plants thrive. Actually, if you go to the Earth Mix, I believe it's on the Earth Mix Instagram. Um, a year or two ago, I did an experiment with Earth Mix Proganics indoor soil compared to kind of a big box store indoor soil that I got. And I potted up the same plant. I let it stay in that pot for like six months. And then we did a comparison. And it is wild. Everything else was the same when it came to plant care, except for that soil that was in there. Now, if I'm going to plant a drier plant, a cactus, Sansevieria, stuff that doesn't, that needs better drainage, ficus, I do this, this with ficus as well. I'll add some perlite. And when I say perlite, it's these, I don't know if you can see it, Bink. It's these little white things that you always find in soil. It's going to help with drainage, um, and also it's going to keep that soil from compacting too much. I'll add perlite, and then I will also usually add some pine fines, which is just a shred, finely shredded pine mulch. And for me, that helps with drainage. There's a couple different opinions about that, but it's always worked for me, um, and I'll kind of do it depending on the plant. I formulate my, my soils depending on what type of plant I have. It's a whole science, and it's so exciting. Um, so you want to have a good soil. I do pot-ups for friends of mine, um, for people that come in from time to time. They'll bring in plants that they've been growing. And a lot of time when I go to repot stuff, I'll see, you can tell when they're using the wrong soil. Sometimes it's just stuff that they dug from outside, which here we are in Middle Tennessee at this nursery. Um, we have a lot of clay dirt. And a lot of house plants, a lot of plants just aren't going to be very happy in that. I've seen that before or um, just outdoor soil. And it's just, it's, it holds a lot of moisture because those outdoor plants and containers are going to dry out faster. But inside, you know, they don't need that. It compacts and those plants just aren't happy. So do your soil research. Um, just make sure you're getting the right thing and your plant will be so very happy. And while we're on the topic of um, earth mix and soils, one thing I like to do to supplement fertilizing, I still fertilize my plants, but 
I will also top dress it with a compost. You can use a compost that you make in your house or you can get compost at your local nursery, your local garden center. Most of them will sell some really great compost. We have the Earth Mix Supernatural that I love, but I will top dress a lot of my house plants. Not all, um, but quite a few. I experimented with that last year. Um, like early, early spring before I would start using a fertilizer, I tried top dressing just to see what the response would be. And it was fantastic. So you can also do that top dressing. I would do like half an inch. And if it's a really, really large plant, maybe an inch over the top of the plant. It also, if you've lost some soil throughout the winter, it'll help just kind of fill that pot back out, water it. And there's a lot of nutrients that are really going to make your plant happy. So soil, very important. I think there's like a slogan that Earth Mix has about like you wouldn't put $2 soil would, in a $20 hole or something. You wouldn't put a, a $10 plant in a $2 hole. <laughs> there it is. I was kind of close. But if you think about that, you're buying this new plant. You're bringing a new friend home. Um, it's going to live in that soil. Like get something good, something that's going to really help it thrive, help it live and in the end, make it really, really happy. So we just talked about top dressing plants, and then I mentioned fertilizing. So let's briefly talk about fertilization. Um, we get a lot of questions here with new houseplant people about how do I fertilize? When do I fertilize? How do I know if it needs to be fertilized? It's, it's a hard thing. I mean, fertilizing is, there's a science, but it's all a science, plant science. Um, I suggest starting to fertilize in the early spring, and doing it like diluted a little bit more than you would um, according to the label. So I usually start with like a lower strength fertilization. And you can use, um, when I'm talking about lower strength fertilization, now I'm talking about probably like a liquid plant food or some kind of granular that you're going to mix up in water and then water it. A lot of people use miracle Grow. I mean, we've got these plant foods here. These are going to be a liquid that you'll dilute in water and then water your plant with it. And a lot of plants have different needs. Like with my cacti, I don't fertilize them a whole lot. I probably fertilize, depending on which kind they are, like two to four times a year. Now with my myken philodendron, that is a hungry, hungry creature. And I fertilize her like every three weeks or so, sometimes every other week, because they like to be fertilized a lot. So like I said, you're going to start in the early spring. Plants actively grow spring and summer. There are different opinions about this as well. Um, but I find that it suits my plants better to let them go slightly dormant in the winter. When I say dormant, I don't mean a dead stick like trees are that are outside, um, like our deciduous trees. But I let them rest. The days get shorter. The seasons change. You know, we go from it being bright from, I don't know, 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. to the sun being up like 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. PM and it's so sad for us. And it's also sad for the plants. Um, so I don't fertilize my plants during that time because they're not actively growing. And it is crazy once the seasons change, once mid spring happens. Um, and even if I don't fertilize my plants, it's just so much new growth. Even if I don't move them, leaving them in that same spot, they can tell the seasons are changing, even though they're inside plants have a sense. They know what they know what's up and they they're going to start growing. So you can start fertilizing spring and then slowly go into your regular um, full, full strength fertilization. And again, research per plant how often you need to do it. Um, and then I'll usually start petering out like mid-August through September. I keep fertilizing, but a lower strength. So then they can start resting a little bit. So that is that liquid plant food that I mentioned. One of my favorites because I have so many plants. And let's be honest, sometimes I can be a little bit lazy, especially when you're working a lot and you don't want to have to keep up with too many schedules. Osmocote. So this is a slow release granular plant food that I will use once a year. So I will usually put this with the plants that I use this for. Um, I'll do it mid spring, give it a little sprinkle and I don't fertilize them again. Some, some of my plants I will supplement with a liquid fertilizer um, while others I will just do the Osmocote and let it be. Um, but like I said, plants can be confusing. There are the numbers the, on the top, the three numbers. Sometimes it's 10, 10, 10. Sometimes like 10, 15, 10. Um, so those numbers are important to look for. 
or look at um, depending on the plant. Like nitrogen is going to be more leaf health. So your leaves are going to be greener and happier. So if you start to see some discoloration with your leaves, if you've done your troubleshooting and it's not water and it's not getting sunburned by the sun, then it's probably a nitrogen deficiency. Uh, phosphorus, which is going to be the second number, is going to be more root health, uh, strong roots. And with those strong roots, you'll have better blooms. And then potassium is going to be overall plant health. So if your plant is ailing, if you have a lot of pests, it might be sick. Um, and it might need a little bit of that. So when you look at your numbers, those are the three numbers that you'll see on a fertilizer label. So on this one right here, and this is a 10, 15, 10. So, so we're gonna talk about troubleshooting now. I'm gonna talk about a few different topics. Um, let's start with leaf drop, which tend to happens with a lot of plants, specifically fiddle leaf figs. They are notorious for dropping their leaves when they're not supposed to. So when leaves start dropping, now some some plants like Benjamina ficus, they will naturally shed leaves. But if you're noticing leaf drop, like a lot of leaves, they're yellowing at one time and just falling off your plant, that's, it's showing a sign of stress. That plant is stressed and it's letting you know that something needs to change. Um, a lot of time with leaf drop, it's watering. It's either, either underwatering or overwatering. So you'll want to check your soil, maybe readjust your watering schedule. With overwatering, there's usually going to be like yellowing spots. It's going to be a little bit mushier. Um, sometimes it'll be on the edge of the leaves near the closer to the base of the leaf or interior. If it's underwatering, a lot of times it'll be dry tips on the leaf and it'll start to like slowly yellow. It's hard to tell all different plant, all different plants, all plants are different. Um, different plants show different signs in their leaves of over or under watering. But with leaf drop, it could be that. It could also be that your plant is root bound and it's time to repot it. So plants do have to repot. They will grow out of their plants. Like we talked about earlier, if your plant is happy and healthy, it is going to grow and then you're going to have to repot it. So if it starts to suddenly shed leaves and you, you're like, I'm a watering pro, this, this is not it. Um, it could be root bound. So go ahead and check. Or if you're like, well, I haven't repotted this fiddle leaf fig in a good four years, it could be time to repot it. It's just not able to get nutrients to those leaves and it's sending it all to the new growth. And so it's gonna start shedding those older leaves, like the lower leaves on the plant. So it could be time for that. And then one more thing to check for are pests. Pests will cause yellowing leaves and leaf death um, and eventually plant death. So we will transition into talking about pests. The biggest, um, I feel like the biggest leaf damage, at least in my experience, is going to be spider mites. They're hard to see until damage has been done, but they will literally suck the juices out of leaves of your plant. Uh, your plant will start to, or your leaves will start to yellow. They'll start to look kind of discolored. You'll notice little white things, little tiny white spiders on your leaves, um, and then some webbing. That's going to be spider mites. That is one of the more common pests when it comes to house plants. Another one is going to be mealybugs. You see this a lot. Um, they are rampant on house plants, and they will take over. Mealybugs are going to be these little white bugs. That they look like if a roly poly was small and white and flat. I feel like that's what a mealybug looks like. And they'll get these little nests that look like they're having a cotton candy party with no exciting pink or blue colors. It's just white. Uh, and you'll notice it on the underside of the leaves or where the leaf meets the stem. Um, and they tend to take over fairly quickly. So spider mites, mealybugs, don't worry. We'll talk about management in a moment. Uh, scale is another one. Scale, I feel like, is not as bad as those. There's hard body and soft body scale. And they're going to look like little, little round, almost sea creature type things. They don't move real fast. They can get huge and really nasty. I've seen a scale that was like this big before. It was absolutely terrifying. It was like a, I know, yuck. It was like a spooky Halloween movie. Um, so if you're noticing these dots that have come out of nowhere, they can be small and they can be clustery and it can look like some kind of texture on your plant, on your cacti. Cacti is more susceptible to this than any other um, pest. Like scale usually attacks cactus. I mean, it attacks everything, but I see it on cactus a lot. Um, or then you'll notice these bigger ones that are kind of spreading out, like, you know, the moms and dads are walking around while the little babies are down low. That's going to be scale. And then um, lastly, I mean, there's a lot, but 
thrips. It's not as common in house plants. Usually, if you're a big, if you're big into annual flowers, sometimes you'll bring thrips into your home with those annual flowers. But they are like microscopic little yuck things. They can be like tan colored to black. Um, they they don't they're not a worm. I don't want to say that. But when I see them, they almost look like this tiny little wormy type thing. It's a bug, and they'll move really fast. They'll kind of jump around. Um, and then white fly. White fly, you'll notice there are like egg sac type things on the underside of the leaves. And then if you touch your plant and there's just a cloud of white things, those are white flies. And then, like I mentioned earlier, fungus gnats. So we've talked about fungus gnats a lot. We've talked about how to treat fungus gnats. So let's talk about um, options for treating those other pests. You always want to start with something that's more organic and non-toxic to you, to your pets, and to the plant. So I usually suggest starting with neem oil, insecticidal soap, or you can do um, kind of a homemade treatment. You can use rubbing alcohol. I usually suggest diluting it if you're using it as like a wipe to wipe those leaves down or wipe your stems down. Um, with rubbing alcohol, you can take a Q-tip, dip that Q-tip in the rubbing alcohol, and it'll treat mealy bugs. It'll kill them on contact. So those three things that I mentioned, and some people make a mixture with Dawn hydrogen peroxide. I mean, there's a lot out there, and a lot of those do work, but those are going to kill the bug on contact, so it's not going to control it. So it will kill the bugs that it hits or that you wipe it, but if there are nests, if there's eggs, if they're hiding in the little crevices, which they tend to do because they're evil little creatures, um, those are going to come out, and you're going to have to just keep on retreating it with um, those oils, with those soaps. Now, if that doesn't work for you, you can move to something stronger. Um, there's a couple different options out here. Here at the nursery, we have a product called Eight. I believe it's pyrethrins that are in it. Tyler, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm not correcting you. I'm not. Okay, so I'm right. I might be wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes science has big words and they can get confusing. Um, but that's going to be more toxic, but you can use it to spray and that's going to help control it. Now, I have used it before and I will usually retreat mine every like two weeks. Now, read the label. Um, I tend to do things out of, you know, doing it hands on out of experience and saying like, oh, it works like that. That's how it works for me. But when you start moving up into more toxic, more um, even if you go into chemicals, you really, really want to read those labels and make sure you're treating that plant the right way and using that treatment um, the way it's supposed to be used. So there's a couple options like that out there. Um, remember that a lot of these things are bad for bees and beneficial insects. It's not only going to kill those pests, but it's also going to kill things that are good. Um, there's a lot of good insects that will eat these bad pests. Um, and we want to be mindful of our bee population. So if you are using something, maybe consider that. Um, I wouldn't say spray it in your house. If you do need to use it, maybe spray it outside and then quarantine that plant in a room that, you know, your pet isn't going to be in very often. And then another option, if it's just way out of control, is a systemic treatment. Um, there's a couple different types of systemic. I use a granular houseplant systemic um, that you put in the top layer of soil. You'll kind of work it into the soil, water the plant. And when the plant absorbs that, drinks that water that is now mixed with that treatment, um, it's going to make your plant toxic. It doesn't hurt the plant, but it is going to hurt anything that eats or feeds off of it. So it can take like upwards of a month, depending on how quickly that type of plant feeds but it will kill the pest eventually. And it does work, but again, be mindful of your bees. And now if you want something kind of cute and more fun and very environmentally friendly, um, you, can, you can do ladybugs, um, there's beneficial mites, there's all types of, um, of little creatures, of beneficial insects that you can get online. We like to release ladybugs here at the nursery. You know, you never know what's coming in on, like I talked about annuals when they come in, we go through so many, um, they can bring pests into our house plants. So we're always mindful of what could be coming in. Um, and so we like to pre-treat if possible with things that are not going to hurt anything. So ladybugs, they're so exciting. We release like 6,000 at a time. There's some videos up. Um, they're amazing. So that's also an option. I mean, you might not want to release a bunch of ladybugs in your house. I probably wouldn't, but you can get almost microscopic um, beneficial insects, do some research online, and there's different ones that will go towards other things. And, you know, some like to eat thrips, while others will control mealybugs, while others will control aphid, which we didn't talk about, but 
aphids are, are another pest that you could do some research on. Um, so that's talking about pests. It's a very brief treatment of pests. We have a lot of webinars here with our botanical boot camp. I know Austin did a great one a couple years ago on houseplant pests and how to treat it, where he really goes in depth on all of the options. I mean, I think he brought a microscope in, so you guys really get to look at stuff in there. So do your research, you know, check out our webinars. Um, we Available talked about- on YouTube. They're all available on YouTube. Yep. Just type in Bates Botanical Bootcamp. I think we're up to what, like 90? Yes. We're in, we're going on a hundred now. Uh, My gosh. We have lots, lots to discuss. And if you ever have any requests, if you're like, they haven't done this yet, um, feel free to message us. You can DM us on Instagram, on Facebook. You can email, um, you can come into the nursery and find one of us and say, listen, you have not done this webinar and I am ready for you to talk about it. Um, so- and Yes. <laughs> so uh, speaking of talking about stuff, Katie on our Facebook page has a question. Can you discuss care of the prayer plant? Oh, yes, I can. So let's talk about prayer plant. So prayer plant Maranta, I wish I had one in here. Um, we lump it into like the Calathea family. Like we put it with on that table. Um, it's not per se a Calathea, but care is pretty pretty similar. If you're not sure what plant I'm talking about, if you look at this Fetonia that I have in front of me, it has a similar look, but it's larger leaves about the size of my palm. They have, they're either red or green. They've got veins and they're really, really cool plants. So when the sun comes up, when they start to get lighting, those leaves will open and drape. And then as the sun goes down, they'll close up. Thus the name. Um, yeah. So that one is going to like a lot of humidity. Now, when it comes to Calathea, Maranta, all of those plants, I'd say this is one of the easier ones. But when I say easier, I don't mean it is, in fact, easy. It likes a lot of humidity. Um, So in the winter, generally with all your house plants, um, when you turn your heat on, your house is going to be drier, thus making your house plants a little bit crispy. So with the Calathea, you'll want to have a humidifier in the room. Or if you don't have a humidifier or if you're short on space, a humidity tray will suffice. A humidity tray is going to be just take a saucer um, like so. Fill it with pebbles up to kind of almost the top. Don't overflow it. I mean, you can mound it up in the center a little bit. Then you'll want to put water in the bottom. Set your plant on top, and that plant's going to absorb all those all those lovely water vapors as that water evaporates. Um, but they do like a lot of humidity. They don't. I find with mine. Um, They can dry out slightly, very, very slightly, but they also don't want to stay wet. So I wouldn't keep it in like a saucer of water at all. Um, I find that one to be, like I said, it's the easier out of Calathea, Maranta, all of those. It tends to be less fussy. Um, Do you have any specific questions on that one or? That was just the question. Cool. Yeah, but prayer plants, um, they're great. They're really cool. I gave one to... um, my nephews because of the way they close and open. So it's a great, it's kind of an interactive plant because of the way it moves. Um, And just really quickly, just to finish, to wrap up with troubleshooting, we talked about pests, spots on leaves, leaf drop. We didn't talk so much on spots on leaves, spots on leaves, um, depending on the plant. I mean, it's different per plant, but usually it's some kind of fungal issue. So you can use a fungicide. Neem oil is is a fungicide. You can just spray it down and hopefully it'll stop it. But you'll want to go ahead and cut um, any leaf that has a spot on it, remove it because it will spread. And also, if you have a plant that looks sick, if you've got a plant with a pest with leaf spot, you'll want to get it away from your other plants because all of these things will spread to your other plants. Um, I had a customer in here yesterday that I was talking with that had spider mites on one plant. It ended up spreading and he had to throw like I think 15 of his plants away. So you'll want to quarantine those plants if anything starts looking sickly. Now remember that sick plants will attract pests. So when I was talking about fertilite, fertilizing, fertilization of plants, um, we were talking about potassium and that being the overall plant health. I have found in just now working with plants for years and also having house plants, if I have a plant that's sick because 
it's not getting the right nutrients, if it's too root bound, just like when your immune system is down in the winter, you're more susceptible to getting colds or the flu. Um, and I find that plants that like if we've had them here at the nursery for a long time, if I've had them at the house and I've neglected them, they'll start looking sick. They will really attract pests. They will be problematic. So that is one of the main reasons and many reasons why you want to keep your health house plant uh, healthy, why you want to repot it, why you want to fertilize it, why you want to make sure that watering schedule is right, why the light needs to be right, um, because sick plants are going to attract problems. So keep that, keep that happy. Um, if your plant is looking floppy or leggy, usually it's getting too low of light and it's reaching for that light. If it's a larger plant and it's reaching, it's going to get too heavy and then it's going to fall out. Or if it's a vining plant, uh, this will happen a lot. A lot of times with the split leaf monstera, it'll start growing towards the light. People come in and they're like, why is it so like stretchy and there's not a lot of leaves? Because the more light those get, the bushy it's get, or bushier it's going to get. Um, so, and you can stake up plants. It doesn't necessarily mean it's terrible for the plant. It just causes some weird um, growth habits when it's, when it's reaching for that light. Um, so we've covered a lot of things today. I mean, there's so many more to talk about. Like I said, there's a lot of webinars. I did a Houseplant 101 webinar a couple of years ago. Um, I've got a webinar about overwintering houseplants, summarizing houseplants. But remember, seasons change. Plants know that seasons change, so you have to adjust watering, fertilization, and possibly the area that they're in. If they're not getting enough light through the winter, they might need to move. Plants go dormant in the winter. A lot of my calathea towards the end of winter, towards the end of winter, they look <laughs> almost terrible, and it's time to throw out. Uh, or I think it's time to throw them out, but I won't. One of the causes being I just don't have the time to give to them because they are kind of fussy in the winter. But also I find that a lot of them out there like to go fairly dormant and they'll start to look sad. Ficus triangularis will drop all of its leaves in the winter no matter how um, much of a green thumb you have. Mine drops leaves every winter and then reflushes. So remember in the winter you might be you know, having some trouble with some plants, but they will be fine. Um, check out our webinars. Come in and talk to us if you have any questions. Like I said, there's a lot to cover. I could talk for hours and hours more, but um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you for joining us here with House Plants 101 at Bates Nursery and Garden Center with our Bates Botanical Boot Camp. I'm Caroline. Have a lovely day.